All right, everybody. This is Phil Cavano from Monster Magnet. You're watching The Heavy Galaxy Show. Rock on. Heavy Galaxy Show, back once again with another great episode for everyone this week. And today's guest, you all know him as the vocalist from the legendary Blind album from the mighty Corrosion of Conformity. He's also fronted Stoner Rock Heavyweights Leadfoot, and he currently is handling lead vocals for the Skull, Legions of Doom, and his new band that he's here to talk about today, Lie Heavy. Yes, indeed, he is one busy guy these days, man. Mr. Carl Gill joins me today. Good to talk to you again, Carl. How are you, man? Hey, man, great to talk to you again. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely, absolutely, man. Well, let's get to it, man. Burn to the Moon. The uh, the debut release from Lie Heavy, I mean, it's out now. And, man, an absolute stellar debut this is, man. I, you know, um, I was as I was just saying, you know, you've got a whole plate full of stuff going on right now, and we'll get on to that in a bit. But Lie Heavy, it consists of, obviously, yourself and, uh, you know, a slew of notable musicians, obviously, right from Raleigh there, North Carolina, including a few of your former bandmates within Leadfoot. Um, so let's start off, Carl. I guess talk about the formation of Lie Heavy. I mean, is this similar to what we're seeing a lot of these days when you guys had a lot of downtime maybe in the pandemic and you got together? Let's just talk about that. Yeah, so uh, yeah, Graham and I had been, you know, been playing on and off, obviously, since um, he joined Leadfoot back in like 1995, I think. Okay. So yeah, Graham mm -hmm. Fry, uh, who used to be in Confessor back in the day, the original lineup of the almighty kind of legendary heavy band, you know, out mm -hmm. of North Carolina, um, Confessor, they were compatriots with Corrosion, they were kind of uh, gentle uh, rivals, you know, of each other, mm -hmm. they, you know, mutually respected each other, and uh, he came out of that, and, um, you know, I knew him from some other bands, but then we uh, had him come in and become the guitar player for Leadfoot on the first two albums, um, mm -hmm. and I've been writing with him ever since, uh, on and off, he came, you know, we started jamming again together, uh, and um we just realized that there was a couple things that we wanted to do and to the to the songs that are actually on um this album on the bird of the moon album were actually written for leadfoot in mm. probably like 95 also 90 you know oh and, wow yeah so nothing to steal first track and uh unbeliever later on in the album were actually written okay. for leadfoot but just didn't quite make it to the first album with uh, with roadrunner Mm -hmm. And um, we're always there kind of back in the background and um, just uh, I don't, we were just kind of getting together and, and talking about stuff and wanting to revisit that and uh, maybe write some more stuff adjacent to that. And um, Leadfoot wasn't really doing anything that much, you know, just a couple reunion gigs here and there. And we said, hey, um, he'd been jamming with TR with, on, on a side gig uh, for a band with a band called uh, Deltoid. TR is the bassist. Okay. Um, who replaced Phil Swisher later on mm -hmm. in Leadfoot, and uh, it, we just decided, hey, let's let's get together and, and write some heavy shit. And um, uh, we joined up with JD, um, a really notable, amazing drummer here in uh, North Carolina. Been mm -hmm. a ton of bands. He was was a lot of heavy bands actually back in the day, including uh, The Point, um, and. Uh, and that this has been, I don't know, he, he's laundry list of bands, but the most notable of late was the Backsliders, kind of an alt Americana thing. Okay. And we just knew he was a heavy hitter. So we just all came together, started jamming. And then, of course, um, COVID kind of hit. You know, we've been coming up with songs and it kind of put things on a back burner, but we had a lot of material floating around. And uh, somehow we managed to write the ship after that and um, carry on. And that's this, this is the result. So. And, yeah, no, it's, I mean, and, and like I say, you know, what stands out to me, I mean, really what caught my ears right away is just, 
like I said, it's just how good this record is. It's it's the fact that musically, musically, I mean, sure, it's got you know the stoner, doom, southern blues influences. You know, like you said, it's similar to what Leadfoot, you know, obviously uh, has done over the years. A lot of those seventies, you know, classic rock riffs and rhythms. But it's it's not just another standard, you know, heavy rock album. I mean, there's a few excellent up tempo tracks that I really love on the album. You know, when the universe cries, and and one of my favorites is Diabolic. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's really just such a well-balanced album musically. I mean, it's just got an array of about every type of heavy rock sound and style you can think of, including like punk and hardcore elements on this as well. Um, and I also just love the way the songs are placed on the record. You know, that's something that I think always is underrated when it comes to, you know, albums and the importance of song placement. And, and I, you know, I know we're living in a day right now where it's all about singles, everything singles driven. But to me, this is a record that, you know, I think has to be heard from start to finish, to, you know, in one sitting to really understand what an awesome record it is. So, I mean, talk a little bit, I guess, about the musical direction on the record for the band. Was the plan to, like, incorporate a little of everything that you guys all enjoy and are influenced by over the years? Or Well, um, first off, I, I want to thank you for noticing the album sequencing. I, that's hugely important. Um, mm -hmm. I've actually sequenced... Um, I look at it as a set list and a narrative. It's kind of yeah. I, feel, I just grew up coming up with a you know in the in the age before singles were the only thing you know um, is where an album was a journey, and mm. uh, I like the idea of it of it taking you somewhere and bringing you in and, and like a well written set list that, that holds your attention. And uh, I'm not sitting here just toot my own horn, but I, I just I think it's really hugely important. So I'm glad yeah you get that vibe and and. Um, that's that was a thing you know we thought about it and in terms of the varied nature of the songs i think it just uh reflects the fact i've always felt you know i don't have one emotion we don't have one emotion we have different feelings <laughs> happiness mm -hmm. sadness, yeah. you know uh rage uh despair whatever uh you know i don't know it is all, all the, it's the whole realm of things you can feel and 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 um all my favorite bands coming up, man, there was, you'd listen to a Stones record or a Who record or a Deep Purple record or a Sabbath record. And the songs weren't just one gear, you know, everybody, mm -hmm. there's different things going on. And I, I feel we, I reserve the right, we reserve the right to kind of just be musical, right? And just mm -hmm. do our thing. And I don't know if it's conscious effort. It's just kind of what's, you know, hey, this is, this is a cool song and it's mm -hmm. us doing it. So it's okay. It doesn't have to be. Um, that one guitar sound and that one riff, that one vibe, that one gear. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. I don't know if that answers that. Uh, maybe I'll yeah. ask that here yet. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Yeah. And also the band, I, I really like the, the name of the band, Lie Heavy. I mean, it's it's really fitting, obviously, because, yeah, I mean, it, it like you said, it kind of sort of, I, I, how did you guys come up with that name? Like, who, you know, how did that come about? School name. I came up with that name just years okay. earlier, just as, as uh, just a, an idea of, of, of just, I always collect kind of words and little things like that and sometimes they end up in songs sometimes they just don't go anywhere but just from reading and you know thinking about stuff and you know it's just kind of like a doodle you know or a thought mm -hmm. that came together and i was like i like the idea of of, of lie heavy you know even though you know it, it can it works on a couple of different levels obviously you can sure uh, you know um you know i don't want to have to interpret for anybody i want people to kind of get reach their own conclusion My whether own. It's not just about oh we're we're a heavy band or something like that. You know? mm -hmm. I totally. think it speaks to other things too. Sure, no, no, sure. And like I said, man, the music really just stands out on its own. It, it's just it's amazing. And obviously, now putting your vocals on, we'll talk about your vocals here. You know, just like the music vocally, you're very diverse on the record as well. I mean, obviously, you've got you know your your vintage style, that Carla Gell style that we all know from back in the day with Coc and and, and early days of Leadfoot. Um, you know, like you said, you brought up two tracks that you know that are right there unbeliever and nothing to steal you know obviously those are you know classic songs that are sung in, in your you know style that everyone knows you for but on tracks like for instance like the long march i mean you 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 could still and you're showing you can still go pretty high man with your with your vocals because that's you know that's not easy to do at your age but i mean you can hit those high notes and it's real impressive and even on the the you know the track lie heavy i mean you've got some different inflections on that one as well you take a bit of a different approach you know uh, the way you deliver your vocal parts is that song as well. Um, so yeah, just like the music, your vocals are pretty diverse here too. So when it came to your vocal, you know, approach on the record, I mean, did you, I guess, intentionally adjust your, your sort of that style that you use, you, you know, people know you for, 
um, you know, intentionally, or is it just sort of what you were feeling and you just kind of rolled with it? Per song? I think this, the, 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 the latter is what you correct that, that it was just what I was feeling. And, um, it always sounds goofy to say these kinds of things, but it's, it's an emotional record. I think there's a, um, a lot more personal stuff in this record. And I was trying to reach for reach a little deeper into myself, maybe to, to go for that. And, and like I said, it sounds so goofy to talk about that, but, um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, I think you know people can i don't know it, you know maybe people don't have a chance haven't had a chance to read the lyrics or whatever or they haven't heard it yet but uh we're going to make those available soon working on updating the band camp and um mm -hmm. and all the streaming uh lyrical uh things going on so but there's songs like drag the world's basically a song of you know of, of, of um getting ditched you know my dad ditching the family when we were kids living in mm. hong kong you know, <laughs> okay. you know? Mm -hmm. weird little things like that but I, I want people to kind of interpret things uh for themselves you know so mm -hmm. i think i think it's just a more more emotional record you know okay on a couple okay. levels so that's it was just kind of trying to push myself to go a little further on certain places you know sure well, yeah you know? mm -hmm. I mean, like I say, yeah, because there's some things on here that I, I just haven't heard you do before. And I'm like, wow, it's really, you know, and we'll talk a little bit about it later because I know you've, I've, I've noticed the same on some of the other things you've been doing too uh, lately in terms, you know, in t including the, the Patriots and Black songs, uh, Legions of Doom and so forth. So, um, but we'll talk about those bands a little bit. I want to get into obviously the video now for the song Lie Heavy. <laughs> Yeah. Um, that is uh, one humorous, pretty damn funny uh, video you guys got out. It's almost like it's hard to sometimes focus on the music because you're just so ingrained into the to the actual you know video itself and how funny it is. I mean, how, you know, it's pretty self deprecating too. Obviously, how did that all come about, and how did you get that classroom full of kids in there too? That's that's one of my favorite parts. Yeah, of I was nowhere near them actually. <laughs> okay, so no, no, um, no, it was uh, so so the video was a concept that was dreamed up uh, by Kevin Dennis, our drummer's uh, JD's brother. Okay, uh, who is a professional uh, camera guy, videographer, has been working in, in Charlotte just a few hours from here mm -hmm. for a long time, uh, involved with NASCAR and like ESPN and uh, I believe CNN and all kinds of like professional like mm. legit avenues and then he's really got it together and he approached the band and said hey i'd love to make your first video and uh we were more than qualified he was like a one-man wrecking crew basically and uh he decided uh, he came up with this storyboard presented it to us with these folders with with our out with you know with lie heavy on the front of the, of the binders and we had a mm -hmm. meeting it was it was awesome and he spilled it out and then he shot like a storyboard uh, like a little video storyboard with a little lego pieces uh -huh. with us you know, it was amazing <laughs> and then we actually went out and did it in in the span of like less than 48 hours and oh wow, okay it was a bunch of location shots um so yeah it's it's it I, you know we were on the ice we had a red, red and ice rink we were mm. at duke at university for the classroom my wife's the school teacher oh, okay <laughs> yeah know, yeah <laughs> uh, miss Alford and uh uh you know, just uh, the location shots. We actually went the the, the pool scenes were at a, a, a at a country club. There was actually a swim meet with like hundreds of kids going on in the background. It was it was pretty funny. Wow. So, no, wow. the whole idea was yeah, it's pretty self deprecating. It's it's not the most flattering video in that sense. <laughs> we said, you know what, fuck it. We just want to come out and, and and we're a bunch of older guys. We're like, let's you know, we we realize you know we're not a bunch of spring chickens, but mm -hmm. you know we want to make people pay attention and have a laugh. You know. Mm. And um, the, the lyrics of the song have nothing to do with the trajectory the tra of the video. The it's the just video, a vibe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's to an, kind of an homage to the, you know, a tribute to the old school uh, uh, glory days of MTV. You know, the mm -hmm. metal band in the classroom and the, mm -hmm. the goofiness of it, you know. Yeah. No, it's so, a fun video. Yeah, it's a fun yeah, video. It's fun. It, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was really, really well done. I, I'm, I'm super happy that he did it. I, I'm really proud of it. Um but you know it, it's just it, it's an attention grabber but um and then it's just you know life's too short you gotta gotta have a laugh you know yeah no absolutely it's it's like i said it's we're, we're gonna put it in this uh we'd include it in this interview so everyone I can check it out too yeah. to anybody <laughs> <laughs>
Awesome. Well, Carl, let's 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 dig back here. Let's go into your history a little bit here. Um, yeah. From the start here, I, I want to talk about you know the early beginnings. You know when you were um, in the Connecticut hardcore thrash scene back in the day. Oh, yeah. uh, in a lot of part of the '80s, uh, you fronted a band, and it's album cover right behind me here, uh, "School of Violence," and the album "We the People." Now that record came out on Death Records. Uh, crossover, like I said, thrash the city every there of uh, Metal Blade back in the late '80s. And there was another little band on Death Records as well, right around the same time, doing the hardcore crossover thing. Of course, that was uh, that helped obviously catapult the heavy rock genre in the early nineties. That, of course, was Corrosion of Conformity. Um, so, I mean, I'm going to sue. I mean, did, did that have anything to do with with Woody and Reed at the time recruit you to come on board for to join COC? I mean, talk about how you wound up getting that gig originally. Well, actually, it goes back a little further than that. So, I was in the okay. Connecticut hardcore scene, and from '83 to '87. I was uh, singing for a band called Seizure mm -hmm. uh, um, out of out of the Southern Connecticut hardcore scene, mm -hmm. and we were very much uh, like a, a, a brother sister scene to uh, the New York City hardcore scene and the Jersey hardcore scene, and, and we always mm -hmm. interacted and played and moved fluidly through those scenes. And uh, it was just a great, amazing time getting to see bands from all over the world, literally coming through Stamford, Connecticut, and then you know, seeing shows at CBs and. Mm -hmm. Rock Hotel, the Ritz, and Irving Plaza, and on and on and on, all the different venues. Um, so I came out of that scene and, and did an EP and uh, different releases and compilations with that band. And uh, at, during that time in 85, uh, up in Enfield, Connecticut, uh, we actually, on the Animosity Tour, Seizure opened up for COC. Okay. Um, and we kind of we just maintained a friendship with them and... and um, I saw them play a bunch of times at the Anthrax, at CBs, and, and New York, all around that area, mm -hmm. uh, even including the Technocracy lineup. And then they just kind of fell off. They stopped playing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I moved on from Seizure in 87. I moved on and joined uh, School of Violence in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just, had nothing to do with the COC connection at all at that point. Uh, it was just me joining that band. I was in that band for just about a year to the album. Oh, okay. And then um, decided to move on. And um, not that much later, I was in another band of no consequence, just a, a project for a minute or two after that. I saw an ad in, in the old days before the internet, there was uh, classified ads. For sure, I know. It. <laughs> and uh, there was actually an ad in the Village Voice Classifieds, and it said, uh, Corrosion for me, uh, Singer Wanted, cross between, oh, wow. cross between, uh, Ian Gillen, Alice Cooper, and HR was one of the, and they did wow. have one across between Hetfield, this and this and this. And I, wow. I saw it twice and I was like, wow, is this real? <laughs> and I had mutual friends um, and checked in with them and they said, yeah, it's legit. And mm -hmm. I said, fuck it. And we got connected and re came up with his girlfriend and the band manager, Karen Mason at the time. And uh, mm -hmm. that, they came up and met me up in Stanford, Connecticut. Then again, we met in New York City. And, uh, you know, they, they saw that I was legit and I was ready to go. And I I just actually finished, was finishing my my little undergraduate degree at uh, SUNY Purchase. Oh, wow, uh, you had to uh, purchase. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, purchased, I went there, yeah. And then, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, and then, uh, I'm educated. So I, I uh, <laughs> no, and then I, um, we had this thing where, and they, they said, come on down and do, you know, uh, we, they sent me a bunch of songs and one of them, which was buried, uh, the demo version of buried, which is on the blind album. Mm -hmm. And I came up with lyrics to that and the vocal melodies and they were the same ones that ended up on the record. So I came down and did a live audition and I got the gig against them back. And it was in May of 89. Okay. So it's kind of this, just you know we we just had mutual friends and it worked out and uh, nice mm -hmm. yeah and yeah. you know did my run with them and that was cool you know yeah yeah no absolutely well the purchase yeah you ever hang out in those tunnels and purchase there oh yeah <laughs> I, well, yeah you remember those things yeah i i, I had a buddy that went to one time to visit so i remember yeah, that. but it's good old purchase man yeah it's a fun place man um so i mean I, what i want to know is how did they know the, you know, the Woody and Reed know that you could sing like you do, considering the fact that School of Violence obviously was not known for its 
you know, I'm sure Seizure too wasn't known for its harmonies and melodic vocals. No, but you're right. You're right. Fed. Yeah. So I yeah, didn't know was, you could sing, man. I was steeped in that kind of, uh, you know, I came up loving those bands and, you know, I love Cal from Discharge and, and you know, mm -hmm. Levy and, you know, Kronos from Venom and, you know, and uh, Tom from uh, Jeep Warrior from, you know, Something uh, Frost. Frost, you know, mm -hmm. Frost and all these other bands. I was like, you know, all about the growl and the, the rage. <laughs> You know, uh -huh. but then all along, I was like, I, you know, I can actually sing, too. And I said, you know, fuck it. I'm going to try. <laughs> I was realizing I was probably going to tear my throat out if I kept uh, going that way. In fact, uh -huh. on the School of Violence uh, album uh, that, that's up there behind you, my it didn't say Carl Vogel, it says Carl Throat. Throat, yeah. yeah. I said see that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah. No, I think I, I I think you know there's moments where I sang earlier, but uh I just was I don't know. I was just like this is gonna work. Mm -hmm. I was just ready somehow. This happened. Wow, man, that's pretty impressive, man. Now blind, of course, you know, obviously that was the rebirth of the band in ninety one. I mean, you Pepper and Phil were obviously all new to the band. And the hardcore thrash sound was the crossover sound was, you know, it was kind of like coming to sort of a it's it's let's say end, but you know it wasn't as you know obviously in the onset in the nineties when all the grunge was out and everything was starting to kind of slow down. You know everything was getting a little more mid tempo and not so yeah. not so fast. And it was getting groovy too. Um, and I know Blind. I mean Blind. I, I believe is the biggest selling album of the band's career to date, if, if I'm correct. But um, but, I, but what an go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just gonna say, but but an interesting time really for you to join the band. During a you really a musical transition, obviously for them. I mean, you you obviously, like I said, you came from that same background they did. Um, but you know, I mean, like I said, a lot of bands at that time were changing their styles. They were transitioning, obviously, and a lot of the bands, those you know, crossover bands and thrash bands, they didn't survive the '90s really. I mean, they really it was difficult. I mean, metal was really not something people were embracing as much, obviously, the '90s. Um, but so that's what I think makes it really so kind of unique. In your situation was that you know you, you guys were able to thrive during a time when most of those bands were you know not doing well at all and a lot of them called the quits really at the dawn of the 90s so i mean in your opinion i mean i mean would you guys you know the fact that you guys were successfully transitioning unlike a lot of others i mean was it that it have to do maybe because you guys had that, that sort of southern groove and you know, Pantera was big at that time with the same sort of groove. They were really the only metal band that was really kind of blossoming at the time. I mean, what what do you think made allowed you guys to be successful in your transition when a lot of other bands weren't able to? I mean, what's your what's your I thoughts? I think I think it was that we were really looking at it from a big picture, just uh, song and music per, musical perspective, rather than uh, trying to imitate anything. You okay, know? I think we were taking mm -hmm. a. a maybe a tougher path because I know the band lost some fans initially too along the way. Sure. And, and you know, I, I think some people saw me as some kind of heavy metal carpet bagger, even though I came out of the mm. hardcore scene, you know, like, <laughs> Oh, I moved down here in North Carolina and turned them into a metal band or something. Yeah. I'm like, man, I, they were wanting me to sing for them. And they also were into heavy stuff, not just hardcore. They were into metal and, and all and lots of different stuff. And mm -hmm. it goes back to what I said earlier when I was talking, you know, it's like, it's all about the song and all mm -hmm. about um, just bringing in, you know, your version of it. And uh, whether that, you know, is Sabbath or Black Flag or whatever it is or, or something completely, you know, could be Jimmy Cliff. I don't know. Could be, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I'm just saying it could be anything. Sure. Mm -hmm. that you're bringing to it just emotionally or, or sonically, melodically, uh, riff wise. I don't know. But mm -hmm. I think it was the whole idea. Of, it was just the, the songs are more important than. um uh, you know, being strictly within the guardrails of, of, of a genre or, a, or, mm -hmm. or an idea of a genre. One mm -hmm. thing that we had going for us, though, in the early 90s was that there was a lot of bands that were different. Like, look at sound what Soundgarden was doing and Faith No More and mm -hmm. bands that kind of had one foot in one thing. And I, I used to love that. You could go see a tour like Soundgarden, Voivod, and Faith No More. You could, yeah. you know, bands there were really cool mixed bills and that was a lot of blues that was happening. I thought the early ones were really positive in that way. They just mixed it up. It didn't matter. Mm -hmm. you know? So I, yeah. think, I think it was a lot of open-mindedness at that time. And I, I think the band survived it, you know, um, 
to some extent because it just said, "Hey, we'll we'll tra be just transcendent and go our own way." You know. Yeah, sure. Now, how much you know? Pr I mean, I guess uh, you know. You kind of just alluded to a bit. You know, being the, the now the singer who came in and. You know, I mean, was there, I guess, a lot of, I don't want to say pressure, but I mean, you know, you know how it is. I mean, you're the new now vocalist, lead vocalist from a already well-respected band that was now in the process of changing its sound. Um, even though you weren't the only new member at the time, but the fact that you, because you're the singer, obviously you're the front man, I'm sure you were going to probably get a lot of the scrutiny or the brunt of the blowback from the a lot of the old school fans, you know, because it's always easy just to bring the same. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the perception is like, hey, it's not the same thing anymore. And it's just like, yeah, it's not. You know, we're not, we're all mm. growing up and into different shit, you know. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I didn't take it personally. I really didn't because, you know, people are just going to, people are going to be like that. People are, mm. there's a lot of people fear change in general. Yeah. That's point. a human condition. I think that's also mm -hmm. beyond just, uh, being a music fan is people's like hey i want my cereal with the same stuff in it I want my, you know what i mean like I yeah i know what you mean yeah i don't like it different i'm used to this you know mm -hmm. so it, it's i think it's more of a, just a human reaction I, I for all the people that were there were people that even in the hometown especially like oh you know I, these guys are sellouts or it's different and mm. you know it just it, over time it just didn't matter because it, it was either you know you can't be for everybody all the time, you know? Yeah. That's true. And also just to stay in one place, of course it can't be the same. It's not the same people, you know? That's true too. Yeah. The same moment in time. There's not the same mm. zeitgeist. There's not the same pushes and pulls. So mm. um, it is what it is, man. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. So let's get in out to Leadfoot. You know, I know, um, you know, after you and, and Phil Swisher, you know, departed COC, Obviously, you both joined Led. Uh, you joined together to form Leadfoot, uh, and you released the band's debut, bringing on in '97. Now, I want to ask you something in, in regards to that record and its release here in the states, which I know like we were saying before. You guys were originally signed, you know, to Roadrunner here, and I remember I was actually working at Roadrunner at that time. Uh, I was interning there, yeah, and uh, I remember uh, my brother. My brother, you know, uh, he used to go down to North Carolina uh, from New York to visit a friend that we were just talking about before that we both have. Uh, Ray, we'll give a shout out to Ray Dewey right there. Um, but he came back, you know, he came up, came back up to New York, uh, and he was like, "Hey, man, you know, I was hanging out with, uh, you know, the old guys from from COC. It was, you know, um, Carl and Phil, and you know, they said they got this band that's on Roadrunner." And I'm like, "Really?" He's like, "Yeah, Leadfoot." So I was like, "Oh man, I wasn't seeing anything." in the office at all about Leadfoot. I didn't see any CDs or I just saw nothing. And I said, man, I, I don't, okay. I I'm looking around. I don't see nothing. Then maybe like a month later. So I saw some CDs in there. Um, and I remember too, I think high time was on one of their compilations, like a summer compilation thing, I think as well. Um, but I never saw anything in there. Not too long after that, obviously, you know, I know the music cartel picked up the record. Talk about that, that whole situation with road order. That must've been just such a, it I guess was, a buzzkill, man. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, it was really, I would say, really fucking disappointing, you know. But yeah, I'm sure we had high hopes. We signed with them. We spent six weeks in LA at Grandmaster Recorders, Hollywood, recording that album, the, you know, back in the mm. old analog studio. That's what was going on. And mm. had a, uh, uh, Eli Ball producing it. He had worked with, uh, you know, Kyle uh, and Floodgate, Kyle. Oh, yeah, yeah, Floodgate. yeah, sure. And, um, you know, and we put a lot into it. Um, I, you know, great sounding record. We had scored Motorhead's management, Singerman Entertainment. Mm -hmm. We had um, Fair Warning, with the biggest booking agent in Europe. Like all this stuff was lining up. We were supposed to be on um, Ozfest and all the shit. And then just uh, the album came out. Literally four or five star. You know, awesome reviews across the board in Kerrang and Rip and all those magazines in Europe that were loving. Mm -hmm. And then for some fucking reason. Roadrunner said, we're not feeling it. We're not hearing you're too rock and roll. We're more interested in Cold Chamber. We're more interested in mm. this and that. No offense to those guys. I'm just saying sure. that, you know, it, and then once they this, they said, I was like, what? It's getting really good buzz, man. And they're like, nope, we're dropping wow. you. And it was right before Christmas. And uh, so the management guys were like, well, there's nothing to manage now. So they backed out and the booking people and, and then the drummer and the one guitar player said, well, I guess it's over when they quit. So oh, wow. it was just one of those things. And, um, you know, I, 
I don't know, man. We had kind of a left foot always had kind of a black cloud in terms of something would always go <laughs> wrong. It's, we would we would try so hard, you know. We we uh, we'd commit a lot to it, and and uh, mm -hmm. they, just, they backed out. And I still have not gotten a clear answer. I've got my theories, but I I don't want to go off. <laughs> but I think it's in general that just they at that time um, there was a lot of other vibes. There was that uh, bands like Cold Chamber, and then they were really slipped out after that. You know, yeah, yeah. It was uh, we were just not fitting the mold or something. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, they yeah, they were really new metal, I know, uh, kind of sounding at the time. I remember when I first heard, you know, Bring It On, it was like, this is a, a different album from the put out. I know they were in, you know, they they had signed a bunch of stoner bands. Like you said, Floodgate was one of them that was on Roadrunner. You know, I know Carmen to Burn. I guess maybe they were feeling okay. out the sound and and just, yeah, I, I just was, was, you know, shocked too. Because, you know, to me, that was such really, that was a record, Bring It On, for me personally, that's I was really uh, all about metal and hardcore at that time. I was younger, obviously, and, and, and you know, full of piss and vinegar. But that was really one that kind of got me out of my comfort zone of that sound. You know, it, it had that vintage Southern classic rock, you know, sound to it. And it wasn't something I was, you know, into at the time. I, you know, grown up with all that stuff. But I remember, you know, putting that record on. I feel like after one full spin, it was like, well, it, it just really caught on to me. And I loved it. And, uh, yeah, I, I was just always so disappointed that, Nothing happened with that record, you know, sure. for you guys, because it was it really was from top start to finish. I thought a, a, an outstanding record, and and like I said, it must have just really sucked, like you said, just just it, the, the momentum, you know, derails that momentum, man, and, and that's just got to be, you know, to get that momentum back. I mean, do you feel like the band? I mean, obviously, you, you guys put out two more records after that, but did you feel like you ever that just kind of deflated? Not deflated, it, but it, it, no, it, it it made things a lot a lot harder. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, like I said, we lost some of the, the, the band band guys, you know, we lost the drummer, John and, and Ryan, mm -hmm. they took off and they, and, you know, but no beef with them. It's just, they felt like they couldn't carry on. And, but we got, you know, we got Tim Heisman, one of the best drummers I've ever played with, um, for, mm -hmm. you know, on, on, you know, no offense to my current drummer or drummers, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Tim came on board and, uh, Scott Little came on board, mm -hmm. um, and we, picked ourselves up and we did it we with the music cartel sure the the budget was 13 times less i think nah. <laughs> but uh you know it was what it was you know we we tried mm. and we we booked uh uh some massive dates mostly in europe uh and, which now 20 years later seems to have been paid off because when i was over there um i'm just digressing here a little bit but mm. I was over there with the skull. I've been over there twice uh, in the last within the, la the last year, mm -hmm. and uh, people came up to talk to me more about Leadfoot than they did COC. It was really wow. interesting. And, cool. You know, the, the, the first show in Germany, the one promoter is like came up to me and says, "You know, I like I love the skull, but." I really love lead foot. <laughs> I was laughing. I was like, oh my God. Was like, what? Are you uh, fucking me? No, uh, you know, it was great. It was funny. That's it's cool. Like, yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, I, I mean, it was amazing actually that people were pulling out old, you know, lead foot merch and, 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 and mm. vinyl and CDs and shit. And I'm like, where the fuck did you get this? So I was signing those over there. So, so it was interesting to say, to hear that we had, we had, we really uh, put a lot of effort in, especially over there, to make things happen. And then, you know, two decades later, people noticed. So, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. that's pretty awesome. Yeah, like you said, yeah. it's uh, so people were. I mean, even though maybe it didn't, you know, happen the way you wanted to, there were still people that were obviously feeling it and, and loving no, the band. Well, know, I was yeah. told you are part of the second original Stoner Wave. Oh, there like, you go. Okay. okay, I'll take that. I don't know. <laughs> I'm all kidding aside, it's great. Sure. Um, to know that people were, were into it back then and are, and are still into it. So who mm -hmm. knows? Maybe Leadfoot might do some dates over there, you know. Oh, okay. And talk to us about maybe doing some festivals, but oh, we'll nice. see. who knows? Oh, yeah. But um, yeah, so Leadfoot was a my baby, my 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 uh we're not ever officially over. We reserve the right to kind of make it okay. every once in a while. Okay, cool. You know, but um and we actually there's a bunch of unreleased stuff um that we we're sitting on too. Okay. Um, that we could actually either re-record or release raw demo form. Oh, okay. So that might be a cool thing, a collectible thing. I don't know, but um, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's yeah. been some talk with different people of possibly reissuing those albums too. Oh, so, wow. Okay. So, yeah, take a look was done through the music cartel, and then mm. um, 
we partnered a company with them for not there was just a mutual thing and then we signed with uh abstract and um luna specifically out of sweden okay and did we drink for free Super with free. yet again a, a slightly different lineup mm -hmm. graham had left and we got johnny zoo back on guitar and um and it's a great album it was recorded at the southern culture on the skid studio in Mebane, north carolina you know the, the, they're a uh, the band Southern Culture down here is a huge, you know, um, cool band mm -hmm. and uh, amazing uh, engineer, Mark Williams, who worked on lots and lots of big projects. And it's a great sounding record that once again, barely saw the light of day because mm -hmm. um, the mastering process screwed up the release and oh, uh, it was recalled before it even really came out, you know. Jeez, really. We had a, like bootleg the record. Oh, it was man. one thing after another. You know? Man, so, oh, wow. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. Well, is that a reason why? Because I know after the, you know, the last Leadfoot record, we drink for free. Uh, I, I don't think really heard much, at least on a, you know, maybe locally there, but at least, you know, uh, domestically really hear much from you for a while I, until I know you were doing the COC blind thing with Reed uh, for yeah, some shows. We, yeah. Yeah. So, we you know, we, we got together and we demoed and worked on some stuff. And there was different versions of that, of that of Leadfoot during that period, you know, after from 2004 on. Okay. Um, but, um, Graham Fry, Scott Little and TR, uh, two of those guys who are lie heavy, mm -hmm. uh, actually Scott's in the skull now. Um, mm -hmm. um, we, we carried on, we tried, we just tried to make it work and it's never kind of caught fire, you know? Okay. Just, and, mm -hmm. you know, getting older people, their jobs, you know? Sure. <laughs> mm, yeah. Real life getting in the yeah, way. Yeah. Of course. Life. But, um, yeah. You know, like I said, it's it, there's still some stuff floating around, and, and we reserve the right to do it whenever. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, there you yeah. go. Sure, absolutely. And then, of course, now, like you said, you, you came back. Yeah, about what 2000, I believe, 15 uh, was when you kind of really made a, a strong return. Obviously, you appeared on the Teenage Time Killers record that we put out, correct? Right. Yeah, and then also, obviously, you had another very impressive. I mean, local band there, King Hitter. You yeah, know, that was a really cool EP that you put out. Um, back then too i mean so what i mean so obviously you were still going though you never really stopped at least up here right i mean you wasn't like right. you were like all right i'm done I'm, you know i'm gonna take a break for a while but right. right yeah so but that king hit a record was solid too talk about about that what, whatever happened with, with that well that yeah we came together i think it was like 2013 2014 we came together and then it, and recorded that and it came out in 2015 early 2015 um mm -hmm. five song ep yeah um we were really proud of it uh, looking to do more um and then at the same time i was doing the coc blind thing I did some mm -hmm. shows with reed and you know his most notable thing was the month out with uh opening for death angel and, and cavalier conspiracy mm -hmm. from oh, yeah. Coast, which That's was right. awesome That's awesome, those yeah. guys were treated us so well um and and reed was still hitting super hard and doing well and at a mm -hmm. good place and i also was pulled in for the teenage time killers thing with a me singing and Dave Grohl on bass, him him on drums, and mm. Mick Murphy on, on guitar. Like and ended up actually doing a sold out show at the Fonda Theater in um, September of 2015. And then that album, oh, okay. we were looking to do more. And for whatever reason, uh, there was no more shows. We were I thought mm. London was going to happen. I thought some other place was going to happen, but it, it just you know didn't work out. Yeah, well, it's tough. So, I mean, I mean to do a live show too with that with that many different guests must have you know. It's got to be challenging. I would and, think. You know, it was, yeah, yeah I get, no. it was challenging for, I know, for Reed and Mick and uh, yeah. Derek and Mace and, yeah, and, and people, you know, like they had to play the whole show, but it was easy for me. I w w walked up and played like three songs, you know, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, like, hey, yeah. bye, you know. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was kind of a cool festival vibe in that way, you know. Okay. Yeah. Sort of like a house band with all these different front men, you know. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it was it was it was a really cool moment. Um, I thought things were gonna uh, go well for King Hitter. Um, it just the, the lineup. I think part of the lineup was kind of threatened by the fact that the COC stuff was going on. I'm not happy about that. So, you know, I don't want to get into name naming names of who wanted to do what and who was upset. It just made it. I thought it. Would, I thought the rising tide would lift all ships, right? Mm -hmm. But. I think some of the guys, the band were a little, felt a little put off that, that I was in a, in a couple of different projects. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. But I'm not, like I said, I'm going to name names. It just, sure. so King Hitter, we tried to carry on as well. Uh, and then again, just, we had lineup changes. Um, Scott and I kept trying, um, you know, it was, 
the two the two guitar players, uh, Scott and, and Mike Brown, were also doing the COC blind thing, so that made it easier. Okay. For a while, but mm -hmm. um, it just somehow there would just be an element of this or an element of that, and it's we just couldn't keep it going. Mm. Yeah, we tried. I don't know. Okay. Sure. I don't know. You know, I just you're a bunch of adults, and then somebody has a problem. It's like. And it just snowballs from there. It, yeah. You know? mm -hmm. It's, it, you know, rock and roll, there's a music in general, like bands, it's it's the team dynamic or lack mm -hmm. of the team. Mm -hmm. you know, Good dynamic. point. It, it can make or break things. And it, is just, it, can, it can go to hell in a handbasket in any given moment, you know? True. Yeah, it's true. I mean, you, you think as you get older, too, maybe those things stop, you know, happening, but it, it's, it doesn't. Unfortunately, it's still, well, you I know. Think, as we get older, we suffer fools less. You know what I mean? Like true. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know that I got to the point where like, am I really going to put up with this at this point in my life? You know, mm -hmm. if I'm feeling like this, you know what? Fuck it. You know, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's kind of different if you're in a band together and you're like 22 years old, you know, and you, you just, you know, your drinking team or whatever it is. Yeah. There you <laughs> go. Yeah. You, know, uh -huh. but, you mm -hmm. know, whatever it is, you know, but I, it is, you know, Sometimes things work, sometimes they don't, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, for me, I've always felt uh, I've, I've had to keep going somehow. And right now it feels really good. So, well, yeah. I mean, right now, let's get into that. I mean, like I was saying earlier, I mean, you've jumped back in, in, into this, I mean, with with a full vengeance here. So not only do you have Lie Heavy firing on all cylinders, but you've also got now, let's talk about Legions of Doom. I know you guys just played uh, some shows uh, this summer. You did some European shows and some festivals that obviously Legions of Doom obviously features members and ex-members of Trouble, St. Vitus, and The Skull. Like you mentioned before, your old bandmate Scott Little from Leadfoot is also in the band as well. And it's a band that pays, just for the people out there that don't know, that it, it pays tribute, you know, to some of the, I mean, obviously, first and foremost, the great Eric Wagner, the late great Eric Wagner uh, of oh, Trouble yeah. and The Skull. Um, and, of course, you know, there's obviously a couple other guys from, from – uh, Armando Acosta, Mark Adams from St. Vitus, Reed, of course, from COC. So you guys are all honoring them with, with Legions of Doom, um, which is great. And uh, so, I mean, now for, for you, obviously, you know, you're, you're filling in for Eric. Now, back in the early 90s when you were in COC, obviously Trouble was doing really well themselves. They put a few records out on American recordings with Rick Rubin. So, I mean, did you, so did you know those guys, Ron and, you know, Holes and everything from, from back in the days, how Way you guys back, connected? That's what brought us all okay. together. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been friends with him for, you know, like, you know, 30 years or whatever, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know or whatever it is. Uh, you know, I, I, I used to go see those guys. Um, we would, we would sometimes, we, our paths would cross and we would come into their shows. They'd come see us and hang out. Um, when we were opening up for Iron Maiden and we, uh, we parked our tour bus and it's a CSC when we uh, we mm -hmm. in front of uh, Ron and Bob uh, Bob uh, Ron's brother's ha mom's house where they were staying, mm -hmm. and had a couple days off and and I you know we had jam sessions with with some trouble guys some CSC guys I remember doing like jailbreak in the practice space with them oh nice <laughs> Barry was in the band he was so hungover I, I wish I still had the pictures of him puking into a little Halloween bucket I don't oh. know how we <laughs> you know, so, you know, no, I'm just saying we were really good friends. Like, and mm -hmm. and um, Ron's my brother. Uh, you know, known. Him, I you know I used to go see Trouble back in the day. I, I Eric would invite me up to sing. I remember singing Helter Skelter. Uh, you know, with with him together mm -hmm. when they were up there for Danzig and Raleigh at the you know, nice. just this awesome guys and and uh, mm -hmm. I was a huge Skull fan. And then you know, obviously. Um, a weird thing is the, the first lie heavy show that was going to happen uh, at the poor house in Raleigh was actually opening up for the obsessed and the skull. Oh, wow. And okay. That's when we, the skull didn't show up and we ended mm. up in the show with just the obsessed, our very first gig. And then realizing mm. that there was not going to, that Eric was not going to leave Dallas. And then he in fact died. Mm. So they, they, they were, that was, and then I, from that show or somewhere around that show, I, I also caught a breakthrough case of COVID. Oh, I survived it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, got word when I, that he died when I was laying in quarantine at home here in this mm -hmm. house. Excuse me. And uh, anyway, it was awful. Just absolutely fucking awful. A huge loss. Amazing yeah. vocalist, lyricist, uh, just a, a total icon. Um, and um, I, somewhere in the neighborhood of about nine months later, 
uh, I got um, Ron reached out to me, Ron mm-hmm. Holzer, and, and said, hey, um, I didn't think I was going to play again. I didn't think I, I wanted to carry on. But I'm sitting here and I was thinking I want to do a, a tribute show. And I was hoping maybe you could come up and, and sing the part, you know, Eric's parts and we can say goodbye to him in, in Chicago. And I was like, literally, I still tear up when I think about it. He reached yeah. asking me. I was Mm-hmm. holy shit this is some canoe sized shoes to fill yeah me. it's absolutely was, you know i was like oh my god really yeah i'm honored and terrified but uh, <laughs> yeah it's no, big, I, I, big I'm task blown, yeah i'm still blown away so i uh no i ended up doing that show and it was uh really well received and it was done respectfully and uh eric's kids and the ex-wife were out there and his girlfriend and wow. old old friends of his family and fans at Reggie's and and uh, with a mm-hmm. banner of him hanging up over the stage, basically, and I, it was just an incredible vibe, and and I I, I felt welcome to it, and I said, hey, let's do another one, <laughs> another show in another part of, of you know of Chicago, another section of Chicago there, and people came out to that, and they said, hey, uh, let's do Europe, you know, let's well, go mm-hmm. and do do some shows over there. And I was like, okay, yes, I, I will do it, you know. Mm-hmm. So and then we that was this last past November uh, uh, 2022, um, Europe. But we did Germany and uh, shown Austria, and it was incredibly well received. And again, I was terrified that that the fans uh, would would say, "Hey, you're no Eric," and blah blah mm-hmm. blah. They, they were like, "No, Eric is smiling." It's one of the things somebody That's said. awesome. And That's I'm, great. I'm still like, "Holy, I can't believe it!" You know. So, um, <clears throat> no, it's an honor to be a part of that, and it. And, and Legions of Doom. So the skull is straight up the skull. And mm-hmm. the spinoff thing is Legions of Doom is me and also um, the amazing Scott Riegers of St. Michael's. Yeah. Uh, no, <laughs> so, yeah. So all these, you know, guys who are amazing, um, Lotar, and, mm-hmm. um, you know, and then um, bringing Scott in, who's obviously a known quantity of that I played with for a long time. No, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's super cool. So we're looking at hopefully writing uh, a new record. Uh, so it'll be, um, I, I'm not sure exactly how it's going to uh, happen and sp- fill out, a, you know, but I think it's going to be part my vocals, part Rieger's vocals. We're working on it. So, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, Ron yeah, was telling us. Yeah, he was t- when we talked to him a couple months ago, he was telling us you guys were going to do some original stuff. And then now also with the skull, you said you're also you know, now, now you're the it's just you singing for the skull. Correct. That's correct. You, yeah. you're taking it. OK, now what's going on with the skull? Are you guys uh, in the process of doing the same thing, maybe writing some new music? Yeah, yeah it go? is. It's yeah. in the works. It's just, you know, like anything else where the, the difficulty with not a difficulty, but the challenge, I should say, is that um, two of the guys live in Chicago. Uh, yeah. Uh, OK. One guy lives in Dallas and two of us live in North Carolina. So, mm, yeah, get together to jam is always a little bit uh, tough. Yeah. Like challenge. Okay, you know, we make it happen and. We, you know, we're into it. So, you know, plus there's modern technology, so we can send shit back and forth, you know, so. Sure. Now, yeah. I mean, now I want to ask you, how, how have you been able to really, ma- you know, maintain the, your pipes now all these years? I mean, I, I mean, it's because, like I said, you don't want to hear you singing those, those high notes. It's, you know, it's uh, the, the fact that you're still pretty much singing at the same level you, you were back in the day. That's pretty impressive. I, I mean, is there something that you do to take care of your voice or is this just. Just you just lucked out. <laughs> booze and there you go. <laughs> <laughs> what I do is a huge rail of blow, and I drink half a gallon of whiskey. <laughs> I'm just Not at all. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, you know, I, I think it just. You know what my mom says? My mom says, "Well, you're built more like an opera singer now." <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, <my God. laughs> <"Thanks, mom."> oh, <laughs> well, leave yeah. it to mom, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. But yeah. <laughs> Stop telling the truth. <laughs> no, uh, so <laughs> I just throw that in there. No, yeah, uh, part of it is just I think I'm just lucky in the sense I, I know my well not luck necessarily, but I know my instrument better. I've been okay. doing it for a long time, mm-hmm. and I've learned to relax a little bit and not push so hard. And and uh, okay, you know, I don't know. I don't think there's. I don't have any kind of uh, Carl's method. You know, I I, I don't. I think it's just. Okay. Uh, just kind of happened <laughs> you mm. Know? Mm. there's no special regime that i follow um i don't have any special vocal exercises or anything like that i think okay. i just i'm just really into it okay <laughs> you, know? you just dig deep and, and it's I'm there huh? deep, 
but I feel it. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe the uh, nodes on my vocal cords have calcified into the right place <laughs> at this, mm -hmm. and the calluses and the tears <laughs> are just mm -hmm. in the right spot. No. <laughs> I mean, I, I really, I would be totally full of shit if I was like, yeah, I do this and I follow this. You know, I, mm -hmm. I just don't. Just, I'm just going for it. That's awesome. That's awesome, yeah. man. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now, you know, now that you've now, you know, called release, you know, I guess I guess you can see you've established really a resurgence in your musical career because you were so you're doing so much stuff right now with all these projects. You know, when we were talking to Ron, you know, he said something I think speaks for a lot of veteran musicians who continue to keep, you know, their feet entrenched in these music business waters. And as he said, he said, I, you know, he's like, you know, we're old. What else, what else are we gonna do? You know, except for play, continue and play, enjoy music, which is like, yeah, it's true. It makes sense, right? So, I mean, do you, are there any goals or any bucket list sort of endeavors that you have as an artist, as a, a vocalist, is, or is it simply just what Ron was referring to? You're just doing it, going with the flow and doing it for the love of it. I, I would like to learn how to master TikTok. <laughs> well, yeah, good luck <laughs> I, with that, right? <laughs> I yeah, yeah, I, I know. Yeah. If, if I could just uh, become 13 years old again. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, I... Honestly, the world, I, I, I am just now coming to grips with so many facets of self-promotion and social media, and mm, yeah, it's just incredible. So, yeah, what, what's an old guy to do but keep rocking? You know, he's right, Ron. It's just like, hey, you mm. know, we might not be the prettiest, but I think I think we know a lot of stuff, you know? Mm. And and uh, that kind of experience, and we have a take on things, and, mm -hmm. um, you know? We, 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 we've seen a lot of good people come and go, obviously, uh, lost a lot of friends. And mm. I guess part of it just uh, makes me want to stay in the fight more, you know? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. It just motivates me to keep going and, and, and prove that it's never over till it's over, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you look at someone like Lemmy, man, to the bitter end, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. One of the, mm. you know, my heroes, the, one of the greatest, sure. you know, Lemmy. Absolutely. You know? Mm -hmm. or a lot of other old timers but but people just you know never say never never say die just go for it you know mm, nice. um, so i think i'm just like i said i think i'm singing better than i ever have or or as well as i ever have and, mm -hmm. and um, still got a lot of uh shit to be angry about and happy about and and uh a lot of, there's a lot of motive motivation out there you know mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no doubt. Well, I'll talk to you real quick too about another project you're involved with. Like I said, it's just it's endless here with you. Uh, that's of course Patriarchs in Black. Uh, you know, with Riffmaster Dan Lorenzo and Johnny Kelly. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. I know you lent your vocals, obviously, a few tracks on the band's first record, and then the next record, which is coming out in October, you've done so again. You've got a couple of songs, I believe, that you're on as well. So tell us what you've done this time around with uh, Patriarchs in Black. Uh, it's actually for the new album. It's just one song. Just one song, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we were hoping to do more, and and part of that was uh, I just couldn't get to some of it, honestly. Okay. You know, I, I, you know, that sounds awful, but but we decided. Look, I'll do this one song, and I'll do it. I'll do this one well, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's lots and lots of great singers all over that thing. So that's the cool yeah. part about the Patriarchs thing is you get to hear all different uh, versions with with kind of like a teenage time killers thing where you have this bass. Mm -hmm you know, of, 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 of Kelly Lorenzo, mm -hmm. you know, uh, not bass. I mean, you know, bass is a B-A-S. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, the foundation, and, and yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, a bunch of different people doing it. Um, so, no, it's just cool, man. Dan, Dan's a machine. He's a real Oh, yeah. Guy. He's, he's uh, and, he, and to talk about a guy who says, never says die. Like, talk about a guy that is, mm -hmm. will never, ever give up going mm -hmm. for it, bringing it. Um, yeah, he, he's awesome, and Johnny Kelly's amazing, and all there's so many other great players like Dave and and, and uh, you know, Doggy Doggy you know, mm -hmm. Dog and mm -hmm. all, but yeah, all these other players. So, um, no, it's just awesome. Um, I did, uh, yeah, on the last time I did uh, three and a half tracks basically. I, I did a, I did three solo and then one that I shared with mm -hmm. John Costco this day morning. On this new one, I, I do a song called Dead or Dying. Okay. It's going to be the first single. Oh, yes. Oh, fantastic. 
I think so. So yeah. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, I think you and Johnny are competing to who's who's got the most projects going on, you know, in, <laughs> in their career right now, man. You guys are both super busy. So let's get back real quick. I'm gonna lie heavy. Uh, so what's next now for the band to support the record? I mean, I'm sure, like you said, you're gonna do some shows locally in North Carolina. Is there any talks about you guys taking it outside of the area at all, off the Atlantic yeah, Coast? Yeah, or, I, mean, I would yeah. love to. I would absolutely mm. love to. It's just a matter of. Uh, time and money right you know like uh you know we're like i said well a lot of us got day gigs you know we got to do sure. our thing that mm-hmm. pay the bills i wish i wish uh i wish music could do that that'd be amazing if it could yeah and hard to do uh, these it, days it, yeah i know <laughs> it rarely does that for most people out mm. there just kids listen yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah right very rare this thing that you get a full ride you know mm-hmm. so um you got to do what you got to do and um so we're just going to see, you know, probably some extended weekends here and there. Just uh, we're just right now seeing if the, the album is getting traction. Um, we're talking hopefully to some other actual labels beyond our. We did an independent okay. release. This is uh, the Bird of the Moon came out. We put it out ourselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, Three hundred CDs initially. Okay, uh, that's all we pressed. Um, we okay. probably are going to talk to somebody and have get in cahoots with with an actual label. Okay. Uh, I don't want to name names yet because we haven't really worked it out. But um, mm. so, yeah, we, we want to obviously do some more videos, do some more promotion. Um, we'd love to get on some festivals, too, and and, and okay. come to your town if we can. It just has to make sense, you know. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'd love to get that record on vinyl if, if that comes out. Like I said, it's um, going to actually. So hopefully okay. our, um, if it doesn't happen through what we are initially, we've talked to. Uh, our, our home away from home, our, our home club in Raleigh's the poor house music hall. And they opened up a record okay. store upstairs. During cool. COVID. Wow. Um, and in doing so, they also decided they were opening up a, a record pressing plant. So they've gotten two machines. Um, it's been a little slow to get mm. up and running. I guess there's a lot of stuff obviously to get set up to do that. I'm not complaining, mm. but oh, I think we're going to be the second or third release. They do a pressing uh, of a limited edition oh, awesome. in house. Okay local raleigh pressing of, of that album nice. which we'll make available as soon as we can through Bandcamp once that gets up and running okay. and um after that um i don't know if we do something with a, another label we'll do an imprint or somebody will put that out there but it's going to happen we're going to make that happen fantastic all right well yeah in the meantime everyone needs to check it out lie heavy burn to the moon is the record it's out now carl where should we uh send everyone to go buy the album i'm encouraging everyone to, you know these days to buy you know and support the you, artist if, so you can yeah. stream it on any service right now and i don't fault you mm-hmm. for doing that in fact i'd love you to listen to it and then if you just if, if it excites you and you want to contribute to the band's well-being and keep us going um it we are <laughs> as we speak band camp is about to happen okay it's, we're gonna launch any day now so that's going to be um and we'll probably set up some alternate stores uh, through other means, you know, through Facebook and stuff, but um, it's going to be the band Lie Heavy at Bandcamp. So okay. lieheavy.bandcamp.com. You know? Okay. And you going to have any of those t shirts available as well that you got on right now? Yeah, buddy. Yeah, I did a little shameless self promotion. Yes, yes. <laughs> will also be available at Bandcamp. They, yeah. So we have uh, we have ladies' wear and men's wear and, 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 and anybody else's wear, any whatever pronoun you're using. I, you know, if a t shirt fits you, go for it, you know. Mm-hmm. fantastic man absolutely well once again lie heavy's the band burn of the moon is the record pick it up now go check it out now it's available on all streaming platforms and carl man appreciate you so much for coming on and taking some time to talk with me and uh yeah i hope to see you guys on the road i really would love to hear this stuff live man yeah, i really would be man i, I said it's a great record thank you very very much man I'm, I'm so stoked to be doing everything i'm doing with lie heavy you know the skull leaves of the doom patriarchs of black and any and other things it just it's been it's awesome it's a great feeling to be doing this with just bringing it and playing music and i'm i'm truly grateful for your interest and everybody else's so thank you so much man okay.